This is Chuck Wilson on Sports, featuring professional and amateur athletes, coaches at all levels, parents, educators, officials, and others, sharing insight and perspective from the playing field and discussing issues that impact the game. Chuck Wilson on Sports and our Peer into Character Conversations are presented by Evenfield, a recognized nonprofit organization cultivating integrity, life skills, and leadership through sports. Now, here's Chuck. Today, Carolyn Thornton joins us with valuable perspective for coaches, parents, and young athletes. A three-sport athlete in high school, she was twice named first-team All-Ivy League in softball and helped lead Brown University to a league title. Carolyn later became the first full-time female sports writer at the Providence Journal in Rhode Island. Honored as Sports Writer of the Year, Carolyn spent 25 years with the newspaper. She is a member of several halls of fame for her athletic achievements and her role in advancing sports opportunities for girls and women. Carolyn serves as Director of Multimedia Content for the Rhode Island Interscholastic League. I asked her what role sports has played in her life. I don't know a role that it hasn't played, or an area of my life where it hasn't played a role. I remember, I think I was maybe five for Easter, my dad and mom gave me a, a softball glove. Or, I'm sorry, the Easter Bunny gave me a softball glove. <laughs> and uh, I started playing softball in instructional league and, and then kind of took off from there. My dad uh, played for the Minnesota Twins organization, so I had a great teacher right in the backyard, and I'd go to follow him to baseball camps and just listen and watch and learn. And when I was in high school, I started working for the recreation department as a coach, as a referee, whatever they needed us to do. Um, so, I mean, in terms of my work life, that's how sports started to kind of play a role. Um, and then I decided, you know, I loved writing and I loved sports. I put the two together, became a sports writer. So that shaped my career at the Providence Journal. And it's just kind of continued ever since then. You developed a really fierce desire to compete. Where would that come from? I'm not sure exactly. Um, I mean, I know my dad was a competitor, and I'm sure that he instilled that in me. I'm not sure. I think that's just sort of an inner drive that you're just sort of born with. What were the experiences that you had early on that kind of fueled the athlete that you wanted to become? You know, back then, we didn't have the benefit of expensive travel teams and the ability to play out of the state, and we just played because we loved playing. And I loved playing in the backyard. My brother and I would play catch just for hours and hours and hours. It's just what we did. You just played because you loved it, and we didn't have huge crowds and, and all that stuff, but it didn't matter. I think that there's a perfectionist in me um, in everything I do, so you just always are striving to, to go four for four in the game and to make every catch and, you know, around the basketball court, you know, to go 25 for 25 from the free throw line, whatever it is. So it's just that inner drive for excellence, I think, and combined with the love of the sport, that's just kind of driven me all the way through. You were a really good athlete, but everybody has some challenges at some point. What were the early challenges that you had athletically? Do you remember one in particular that was difficult for you? Um, I guess I didn't really think of it that way. I mean, it's just a process. You know, and I even tell kids when I'm coaching or even as a sports writer or in my job at the Interscholastic League, kind of to enjoy the journey right. and the process. And I mean, I can't say I loved every single practice I ever went to, but I understood that it was a means to an end. And you just work through those. You work through slumps. <clears throat> you know, everyone has them in life or in sports, and you just work through them. You know that, that old saying, don't let the highs get too high or the lows get too lows. So I just sort of kind of have that in the back of my mind with, what, with whatever I do, including sports. Brown University, four-year starter, and you had a really good team that blended so well together. Uh, you're a center fielder throughout it all. Take us back at 1990, undefeated in Ivy League play. What was it about that team that allowed you to win so many close games. I mean, you won 13 of 18 one-run games, eight of 12 two-run games. That's more than just a trend. How'd that come about? <laughs> you remember more than I do from that, <laughs> as far as the wins and losses go. You know, it's just, it's, 
it's always your goal to win whatever title is in front of you. And I remember playing at Harvard. That was where we clinched the Ivy title. And that was pretty exciting. You know, I don't remember a whole lot about the game itself, to be honest, other than just the feeling of, of clinching it and walking up the street singing, we are the champions. And, you know, uh, Phil Pinsons was our coach. And one thing I just, that stands out to me is he drilled fundamentals. Yeah. I mean, I just remember, you know, bunting drills and defensive drills. It was over and over and over again. And I think that's what made us, made myself, a good player in a great team is it was just repetition. And sometimes I think that's lost with programs, even the, the so-called travel teams. I think some of that, that focus on the process and in the sort of tedious mundane details, but those things all pay off in the end. And I think that's what happened for us as a team. Um, and so it's a really proud moment for us to say that we were Ivy League champions. What was the culture on that team? How would you describe it? It was a fun, fun group of players to play with. I mean, I really enjoyed all our teammates, and we were all just focused on playing as well as we could when the opportunity came up. A lot of the, the names and things escape me, mm -hmm. but the feeling that you have and that yeah. you take away from it is what stays with you. It was just a great, great experience. and I mean, it shaped who I was at Brown. You know, I don't think my experience at Brown would have been what it was without softball and without that team and the experience I had and that all the lessons I learned from being a part of that team. What did you take from that experience that helped you in life? I mean, from all of those experiences, not just at Brown, but in high school and beyond, um, I mean, you learn about how to overcome adversity and just how to work through difficult times and you find out what you're made of in, in pressure situations, you know, and when you do come through with a key hit or a key play or a key catch, whatever it is, it's affirmation of, of the power that you have and what you're capable of and what you're capable of overcoming. And so you take those into the workplace, into family life, and, you know, into the unexpected. I'm reminded of our recent leadership workshop that we did with students at the Rhode Island National Guard's Camp Fogarty. And Major General Chris Callahan talked to the students at the very beginning. And he said, you know, it's easy to run a race when the weather conditions are perfect and it's not raining and, you know, the course is perfect and you're in great shape. But it's what do you do when it's 32 degrees or it's raining or it's the course is muddy or it's rocky, you know, because the reality is that those are the conditions you're probably going to encounter more times than the perfect mm -hmm. conditions. And so it's learning how to navigate through that, that really, um, I think, reveals your character and, and um, just shows you what you're made of. Early on, what did you see as the ideal teammate? What did you want to see in your teammates? What did I want to see in my teammates? Just someone who's willing to work as hard as I am, that's as focused as I am. Um, that has the shared goal of the team's success. Another thing that I think is unfortunately lost sometimes in today's culture. When you realize that you're all pulling together for that same goal, it's pretty amazing what you're gonna accomplish. The team first mentality. What has happened? I think some, some of us have lost focus on what that means and the importance of it. I mean, I think, to, to go back to some of your earlier questions, my goal was always to play as high as I possibly could and to challenge myself on whatever platform that is. And so, so that's a part of, of these travel programs. But there's also that focus that you want to get seen and you want to get recruited and you want to get to the next level and, and you, you, know, you want college coaches perhaps to see you and to, to recognize your ability. So if that's in the back of your mind, you're not necessarily focused so much on the team. In the softball world now, there's time limits on the game. My daughter, she plays travel, and it, it, was, it was shocking to her in the first game that she ever played in, in the college showcase world. I think it was like the sixth inning, there were runners on base, there's a batter up, and then the, the timer goes off, and they're like, okay, that's it. <laughs> and, and they all walk off the field, and she's like, what, what, 
what? <laughs> you know, and, and that's just sort of the, the structure of college showcases, you know, to keep everybody on schedule. And, yeah. and, uh, and that was a very bizarre concept. So when the focus stops being that you're competing to win that game, it, it's an interesting dynamic. What's missed is the fact that coaches are looking for the intangibles. They're looking for character traits. They're looking for the things that you can do to help a team and work within a team concept, especially during those times when maybe you're not playing your best or the team isn't playing particularly well. How do you react? Are you finger pointing or are you finding a way to be able to lift up your teammates and so on? These are things that I think we need to instill in young athletes, but I'm not sure that, that they were intentional enough about doing that. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, it's interesting that you say that because at one of the college showcases, I'm uh, considered the team liaison for her team. So it's communicating with the coaches that are in attendance, if they're there to see a particular player, or if they want to see that player in a particular position, that kind of stuff. And uh, one of them said, I'd almost rather see the player that I'm looking at go 0 for 4 rather than 4 for 4, only in the, in the sense that they want to see how they react. Are they throwing the helmet? Are they throwing the bat? Are they pouting? Do they stop playing defensively because they're so focused on the at-bat before where they didn't get the hit, that kind of thing? And I think that that is something that, that the kids have to realize, is they want to see how you react in the bad times, in the ad adverse times, and how do you overcome that? Um, do you lose focus? You know, um, unfortunately, there are some kids that are fine with going four for four, even if the team loses. And then there are others that they can go four for four and the team loses and, and it means nothing to them that they got the hits. It's a difficult time, I think, for kids to navigate. You know, it, you know my daughter was, was playing and looking for college coaches to see her, recognize her, and be interested in her. And, you know, and, and there's a whole process where, you know, we tell the kids, reach out to the coaches, you email them, you send recruiting videos and all this kind of stuff. And, and there was one day during the season and I said, you know, Coach XYZ is here. You might want to go over and just introduce yourself. And she got in the car and she's like, you know, I, I just want to play. Sometimes I just want to play and I don't want to have to worry about that kind of stuff. When I was playing, there was nobody there behind the backstop watching us. Weren't many fans there. And it didn't matter to me. I was there to play. I was there to just have fun and enjoy the game. And today's athletes, it, there's a different kind of pressure on them. And so it's understandable that it would be confusing, you know, as to what your priorities are supposed to be. Peer leadership is incredibly important. What are the traits that you've seen that are effective in being able to relate to teammates? You know, I, I think that to focus on your own game while also making sure that you uplift your teammates and, and help them feel confident that they can come through in the clutch situations and that they can work through those adverse situations is a difficult balance. I think a lot of times that C is put on a, an athlete's uniform without really giving them any guidance on what that should mean. And... There's a lot of responsibility in that. You're, you're sort of the liaison in between the, the players and coaches. You're setting a, a great example, I think, just with your actions. You know, I, I don't think that some kids understand how powerful that they are just by how they conduct themselves, getting to practice on time, um, helping to pick up the equipment. Right. I've never been a, a fan of the teams where the freshmen are, are expected to put all the equipment away and then it falls on the team if a ball gets left out. I mean, you're all using the equipment. You should all pitch in and, you know, the sort of hierarchy of you're worth more or less depending on what year you are on the team. Um, it's showing that you all do what needs to be done to achieve your goal, whether it's in practice or in the games and whatnot. And a good leader, a good captain understands that and conveys that to everyone. It makes everyone feel valuable regardless of whether they're the star, whether they're the leading scorer, or whether they're on the bench, but they're an important role player in practices. And you never know when that bench player is going to be needed in a key situation. I mean, there's so many unknowns in a season. And 
So making everyone feel that they matter, because they do. What would you say was your most challenging leadership moment? Because you were a leader on the teams you played on. Um, I mean, there are times, I, I suppose, that I, that I maybe felt I was so invested in teams and almost felt like I cared too much or more than, you know, you have to understand sort of the, the culture of a team and what everyone's goals are, and sometimes you have to adjust those. I mean, I just remember going back to high school just a moment after a game when, and I can't even really remember the details of it, but I just remember being on the bus. And I'm like, I just care so much about, about this team and, and playing well and, and, and feeling frustrated because maybe I was a little too serious at the time. I don't know. Um, You're saying it in a nice way, but really you cared about winning more than some teammates because not every kid cares about their role on the team and winning as much as others. Very frustrating, especially if you're not winning. Yeah, well, the funny thing was, to be honest, in that particular moment that I remember, we had won. Yeah. We had actually won by a lot. And it was almost, as I, as I think back, it was more, um, I don't know if we were running up the score in that particular game. It was just something about how everyone was conducting themselves. You know, it's funny, because I wanted to mention to you how many times now in my role at the Interscholastic League where I'm obser observing a lot of games, a lot of playoff games, and your words, the way you win matters, come to mind in a lot of ways. Because at, at that moment, you know, I, I felt like maybe we were disrespecting the game a little bit or disrespecting our opponent, and, and that wasn't okay. And I recognized that, and I remember getting frustrated. So when you talk about the challenge, that comes to mind often. What does that look like? Those situations in which maybe it gets a little out of hand, mm -hmm. you're really beating up on an opponent and so on, because look, you're out there to play as hard as you can. It's not about letting up on the opposition. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on that balancing act? Because it's not simple. I just always remember that you're gonna be on both ends of a lopsided game at some point. You're gonna be the team beating somebody by 40 and you're gonna be the team losing by 40. It's just the way it goes. And just to never forget that and not to forget how it feels on both sides. It's about respecting the game and respecting yourself and respecting your opponent that I just think is important. Um, sometimes you get carried away, you know, when things are going great in a softball game and you're winning by a ton and it, you know, it seems like you can't, you can't miss. You get a hit every time up, you can hit it wherever you want. You know, you're loose, you're having fun, and, you know, but then you kind of look over at the other bench and, and you realize like it really stinks when you're on that side too. Competitive integrity. I love to ask this question. You know, what does that phrase mean to you? Because sometimes competition and the integrity of a game are in conflict. Yeah, you know, as a, as a coach, I've, I've talked to the players, and I'll say to them, when you wear that uniform, you're not just representing yourself. You're not even just representing your team. You know, if you're playing for a high school, you're representing that school, and you're representing the community. And for some people who may attend that particular game, that might be the only encounter they have with your particular community. And that's the only impression that, that they'll be left with. And I mean, that's a big responsibility and, and one that a teenage kid doesn't really understand. But I just feel that it's really important to represent yourself in the best light because the ripple effect is pretty far and wide. When we talk about sportsmanship, sometimes I think it's viewed by, by many as being in conflict with being a really strong competitor. I think you can do both. I've never understood completely the idea that, well, I can't shake hands after a game because I'm too competitive. I don't really buy that. To me, that's kind of a cop-out, but I understand that there are different opinions on this. How do you view it? I mean, it can be really hard to shake hands after a game that's been particularly competitive. Um, and as you were asking that question, I am thinking back to the basketball championships just this year 
at the Ryan Center, and um, you know you've got, say, Hendrickson and LaSalle. I mean, there aren't many more fierce rivalries than that one. And during the game, I mean, it's intense. I actually posted a picture afterwards because after the game, the two coaches, you know, shake hands and put their arm around each other, and you know, they recognize like you can go full bore for that entire game, but then it's done. And you've got to respect that your opponent, the other coach, did everything they could, played as hard as they could, and, and at the end of the day, you know, it, it's a weird balance, <clears throat> right, when you say it's only a game. Because, right, it is only a game. Totally. But, but yet, it means so much in a lot of ways, and it'll have a lasting impact on everyone who played it. I mean, there will be moments that they look back on decades later. I, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to an athlete or a coach, and they can recount a game, like minute by minute by minute, and the score and everything about it. Um, Cindy Neal, who coached uh, Smithfield High School in 1972, it was the first girls basketball state championship in Rhode Island. And so I asked her, this is the 50th anniversary, so I was asking her about, I mean, you'd think it happened yesterday. So in that respect, it's lasted the test of time. But at the end of the day, did the Warwick players somehow not move on afterwards and have wonderful, successful careers and maybe you know, play at another level and whatnot? So it's a really tricky balance. It's important, but it is just a game at the same time. We talked about the way you win matters, the way you compete, the way you treat other people and so on. Yet we have all of these aspects of competition, gamesmanship, uh, trash talking, uh, the psychological tactics that can be used to try to frustrate somebody. Uh, maybe it's the best soccer player in the other team. We're, team. we're gonna try to rough up that person, try to get into their head, manipulating the rules a little bit and so on. And some of this is age dependent, some of it is just wrong, I think. But where that line is depends on who you talk to. And you've seen it from so many different angles. As a competitor, as a writer, as an observer of so many games, hundreds of, and thousands of games now, with the Rhode Island Interscholastic League. So I'm wondering where you are on this whole issue of what's within bounds, what's okay when it comes to competition. And trying to play the game honestly and respectfully and safely. Uh, you know, there's like this fine line between being a, in a tough, aggressive competitor and then crossing the line. Um, I'm, I'm not a fan of people who use unfair advantages to succeed. I mean, I feel like you, you put your talents up against somebody else and, and may the best man or woman win at that point. Um, so the challenge is what's unfair yeah i mean taunting and and the trash talking you know i i've never subscribed to that personally so um, i know there are certain sports where that's the culture and it's accepted but you know when when you kind of come up to the line and then you step over it a little bit and then now the line's moved a little bit and then over time that line gets moved and moved and moved you know, the, the Interscholastic League's sort of tagline is we're the purest form of sport. And that's not always the case in other sports arenas. I mean, I think that uh, we, we get tested and challenged all the time in that respect. Uh, but it's uh, a much bigger issue beyond the world of sports, I think, unfortunately. I think as a society, we overlook some of the things that aren't acceptable when the result is a win. Coaches. What have you seen that makes the huge difference when it comes to coaches being able to communicate, relate to players, be able to get the best out of them, and also have them focused on playing so-called the right way? There's a lot of responsibilities to being a coach. And I don't think everyone realizes that. And I think it's, it's even more complicated today um, in some respects. I, I think you need to be fair and consistent, but I think you need to communicate that as well. You need to communicate what your expectations are for the team, for the players, for the parents, 
you need to communicate that up front so that everyone kind of understands what those expectations are. But the communication doesn't stop there. I think it's, it's a constant exercise in giving feedback. I think, you know, more than anything, it's understanding that it's not just a player, it's a person. And making them feel like they matter, regardless of what their role is on the team, kind of goes back to the captain's role. And uh, just being fair and consistent. And, and no one wants to be yelled at. I mean, we, we can look at coaches over the years <clears throat> that have been very successful. Sometimes I wonder what the price was paid on those athletes after the fact. Respect is a, is a big part of it. And fundamentals, and you know, I talk right. about Phil Pins and Sit Brown and the repetition and understanding the process, the importance of the process. To go back to my daughter, you know, she's playing basketball and her team ended up co-oping with an, another community out of necessity. They just weren't enough players on either team to field the team on their own. And even so, we just kind of knew they were going to have a tough time, a lot of new players to the game. And in talking to, to one of the coaches before the season started, I said, you're going to have to understand that success this year probably won't be measured by whether you win the championship. And I said, it's going to be measured in a lot of other ways that I said, you might not realize it now, but they're going to be more meaningful down the road. And it's, it's going to be that player who starts out maybe not having ever played basketball before. And by the end of the season, she's going to be a better player. And they're going to learn to play together better by the end. They're going to mesh and they're going to learn. You know, these, they've never played together before. There's so much. You've got to get used to the new coaches. And they won some games and they lost some games by quite a bit. And my daughter was the only senior from her school there was only one senior from the other school. And, you know, she said to me, and it was after a, a pretty lopsided loss, and she said, you know, I wasn't sure how this was going to work. She said, but this was one of my favorite seasons. She made lifelong friends. She still communicates with that other senior, and they'll probably be friends forever. And, you know, if you'd said, well, we didn't have a winning record and we didn't go to the playoffs, or we didn't make, win a championship, so it was a failure, I think that that would be a real disservice to how much they learned and how much they grew as players, as people. And so that's what sports should be all about. And unfortunately, lots of people out there would have measured that season as a failure. And it would be, it'd be too bad if, if they couldn't understand that the process and the, the growth that they experienced was so, so valuable. You've been able to chart over a period of time fan behavior at games. It's a huge problem. The Rhode Island Scholastic League has worked on this really hard. Some progress is made, but it's in an environment in which it's become increasingly more difficult. What have you seen? What's that, that 25, 30 year, what does it look like? It's interesting because uh, in my role as a sports writer, you know, you're supposed to be objective. You know, you're, you're observing and reporting. And then in, in, at the Interscholastic League, it's a similar role. I mean, we're there to administer championships. It doesn't matter to us who's playing in those final games. And so, you know, in my role as director of multimedia content, you know, I'm taking video, I'm taking photos, helping to administer the championships. So a lot of times, I mean, I can just pic picture one particular soccer championship. So I'm kind of on the track. So the game's in front of me and the fans are behind me and I can't even tell you the things that are said and, and the way adults speak and treat young people. And it's so easy to get caught up in the moment and the craziness, but it, it's not acceptable. And they're torturing the officials and they're torturing the other teams and it becomes personal attacks and I want to say to them, you know, they're 15, 16, 17 years old. And if anyone ever attacked your own child that way, what would you do? How would you react? And it's interesting when, you, when you're distanced, because I'm a parent too. So I've been up in the stands watching my kids play. And it's easy to get, to get emotional and get worked up and become so invested. But it's important that we kind of keep ourselves in check because 
The result is officials don't want to officiate anymore. Frankly, coaches don't want to coach anymore, partly because of that. And there are probably some kids who may come away from certain experiences and not want to play anymore. Well, and that just all runs contrary to why we're doing this. What's the um, one change you'd like to see in youth sports that you really hope will happen? You know, and I think, again, this is going back, because my, both my son and my daughter have played travel everything in whatever it is that they've done. And we're at a point right now where we're all so overscheduled and, and every sport is now becoming a year round endeavor. And so you've got overlap. And I think about the times when say we're playing travel basketball and travel softball and you, know, you drive up to Boston for a basketball game in this tournament and then you're rushing down, you know, going the speed limit of course, rushing down to the next softball game changing in the car and there's some fun to sort of the craziness of it um, but I think that it's all being jammed into this small time frame and I don't think you're able to be fully present in in each moment and really be able to appreciate what each of them has to offer and it's easy to get caught up in sort of that that whirlwind and I think there are parents that don't think they have the option to say, this is too much. This is too much for my child. This is too much for us as a family. There's a lot of sacrifices. And what's the end goal? And I think sometimes you, you sign up and maybe you don't understand initially what you signed on for and then you're in the middle of it and you're like, ah, now what? And you feel like your child's gonna get left behind. It's all gonna work itself out. It, it will work itself out and it'll be fine, and you need to take a step back and breathe and allow yourselves all to be, to be present and to really appreciate why you're there, why you're there and, and what the experience is. Finally, I, I hope you really feel good about the role that you've had in advancing girls' sports because you think from a competitor standpoint, from being the first uh, full-time female sports writer at the Providence Journal in Rhode Island to the work you've done, as a coach and then with the Rhode Islanders Scholastic League, 50th anniversary of Title IX, and girl sports uh, have just blossomed, giving so many kids opportunities that they didn't have at one time. Just leave us with your thoughts on what that evolution has been like and, and to be part of it. Well, I was asked, especially back at the newspaper, you know, how it felt to be the first female sports writer and what obstacles I overcame. And, I never set out to say, I'm going to be the first female sports writer. You know, I was following my passions and, and what I enjoyed. And, uh, you know, I love the, the phrase, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And I think I was fortunate in a lot of respects. Um, the opportunities that, the doors that were opened, and, and I was fortunately ready to accept those. And, you know, I just wanted to do the best job that I could in whatever job that was. Um, in terms of Title IX and, and that kind of thing, there are girls today who don't know who Alice Sullivan was. And they don't understand that if it weren't for Alice Sullivan, they may not have the opportunities they now have 50 years later. But it's also a good thing because it means that all those opportunities are there for them. And there were a lot of other pioneers along with Alice, physical education teachers, who formed that group that did play days, you know, and a far cry from what the girls get to do now. And so they were doing it. I mean, Alice was selling chocolate bars and t-shirts to have enough money to host these championships for the first girls that played. So we've come a really long way and it's great. And now what we need is for this generation of females to understand, you know, you love the sport, give back to the sport by being great role models teaching what you've learned to the next generation so that we can keep moving forward. I'm very fortunate to have been able to explore my interests, my passions. You know, I, the way I say it is you want to strive to be the best you that you can be, and, and that you is different things for everyone. It's for me, for you. And to not get caught up in what you think you should do, um, but what you're destined to be. So um, if I can help someone find their path, and that's, that's pretty awesome.
Great stuff. Carolyn, thanks so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. That's Carolyn Thornton, Director of Multimedia Content for the Rhode Island Interscholastic League. This presentation was written and produced by Chuck Wilson. Post-production editing and graphics by Chris Gemma. Narration music by Musical Man, licensed through PremiumBeat.com. Theme music by Patrick Runblad, also licensed through PremiumBeat.com. Our thanks to Professor Mike Davis and his digital production class at New England Institute of Technology for the recording of this interview. The recording took place at New England Tech's East Greenwich, Rhode Island campus. We also thank Evenfield's Board of Directors and the following in particular for their support of Evenfield's mission and this multimedia production. Thomas J. Scala, the John and Jessica Pincus Family Fund and highly regarded businesses in Rhode Island, the Virtus Group, Trusted advisors led by Mark Cruz providing an array of comprehensive financial planning services for families and businesses. Epic Promotions, the Kudo family has four decades of experience in printing, branding, and marketing. Thank you, Barry, Adam, and Keith. Graphic Innovations, a New England leader in large format printing, graphics, and vehicle wraps. Our thanks to Jim Larkin and his team. We also appreciate the support of Sheehan and Associates, providing small business legal services in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Thank you, Megan Sheehan. Simply J Bookkeeping and Consulting, a Massachusetts-based bookkeeping, accounting, coaching, and advisory firm that partners with organizations whose mission is to serve people and their well-being. Our thanks to Jillian Johnson. Chuck Wilson on sports and our peer into character conversations are presented by Evenfield, promoting integrity, life skills, and leadership through sports. If you enjoyed this program, please like us on Facebook and subscribe to this channel. And if you believe our content has value and you're in position to support us, your donation of any amount, big or small, would be appreciated. Evenfield is a recognized 501c3 nonprofit organization, and donations to Evenfield are tax deductible to the full extent allowed by law. You can learn more about our organization at evenfield.org. I'm Mark Kestisher. And I'm Chuck Wilson. Let's inspire kids to exhibit competitive courage and to understand that the way you compete, achieve goals, interact with people, and do everything else in life shows the world how you value character and respect for others. Let's encourage each of them to be a person of integrity who is worthy of trust on and off the field. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.